Senegal, the fellow of the Institute of Information Management for Africa. You are welcome on our October webinar titled The, the Evolving Data Management um, Society, which is the standard frameworks and trends. This is a very good topic. Uh, with us here as our guest speaker for today is no other than Nino Letarello. I guess I got that right, Nino, yeah? Um, who is the president of the Italian Data Management Association for EMEA Regional uh, Coordinator. Mr. Nino is an internationally recognized project and data management expert and advisor to various governments, major infrastructure, change, and information management programs. He is the recipient of the Dama International Excellence Award 2020. Uh, he was part of the top 100 most influential people in data and analytics for 2021 and has spent the last four years sharing, promoting, and educating corporate and, and non-profit institute on projects and data management best practices and standards. He is currently the president of the Italian Data Management Association and the first Europe, Middle East, and Africa regional coordinator for DAMA United Nations advisor and WSIS high-level track facilitator. He's a member of the UK Olympic expert panel. He's the co-chair of the MIT CDO symposium promoting initiatives on women in data, ethical data management, data benefit for communities and smart and sustainable travel. He is the founder and the CEO of FIT Group and ENE Limited, management consulting and training firms with offices in London, Bologna, Morocco, Mexico City, and Singapore. Wow, um, Nino, I was nice to have you, Nilo Natarulio. I was in Italy in March. I wish I've seen you. Okay, that's fine. We'll see now it online. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please permit me to welcome our guest speaker for today, Mr. Nino Letariello. Over to you, Mr. Nino. Nice thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you for the, for, for the introduction. Thank you all for uh, having me here and for Dr. Roy for, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure. It's, uh, it's, it's very nice to, to be able to, to share some, uh, some of uh, the thing that uh, we, we could see from, uh, from, from my area, from uh, some of my experience and or some information that I just gathered around over the last uh, few years. Um, I just want to be sure you, you can hear me well, but uh, otherwise, please, I will also try to monitor. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Please. Perfect. And th that's great. So, uh, well, the, the introduction is, uh, is a little bit of the highlight of what uh, occurred over the last few years in my life. There is, um, I just want to spend just kind of a few words just to let you know how I end up uh, in, uh, in a data management profession, which I think uh, it is where a lot of us today are. Uh, are. So I'm, uh, as a form, uh, to, to, to include something more, I'm a dual Italian and British uh, citizen and I'm an engineer as a background. And I've started my career working as a project manager in major infrastructure schemes. These being bridges, tunneling, public transport. I worked for London Underground for a few years in London. And during that experience, I pretty much raised through the rank up to uh, managing, having the honor to manage the, the Olympic and Paralympic London 2012 portfolio of a project. And that back in 2010, we were looking at uh, roughly 8 billion uh, US dollars of investment infrastructure. And uh, that was uh, the, the kind of first part of my career, but it was also the, the start of the second bit. And during the second part, three things happened. So following from the Olympics uh, is a quite a unique, uh, uh, unique project, unique uh, uh, initiative to work for a uh, kind of niche market. So I decided to, to start uh, to, to open a firm. I launched a consulting firm, which is uh, uh, named Enne, 
from the initial of my mother, father, and myself. So that is what mm. N stands for. And that was a project management company focusing on major event planning, major events such as the London 2012 Olympic. I then fly to, I traveled to Brazil where I work on the 2014 FIFA World Cup, the Rio Olympic Games, the Toronto Pan American Games, and so on. And uh, I, that company raised up to 70 people, between 70 and 80 people, and I sold that firm in 2017. And during that time, three things occurred, as I mentioned. The, the first one was uh, that during that time and during organizing on such a major events, uh, a lot of planning is uh, uh, required. And uh, whilst a lot of planning is required, the data becomes very important because the right assumption may have cause on the investment. I give you an example. Uh, when you think about this mega event, it's very easy to understand how many people will be at the Olympic Stadium because that are ticketed event. It becomes mm -hmm. much, much more difficult when you look at events such as the marathon, where uh, it dependent on whether it depends on if your nation is competing for that marathon or not, is mm -hmm. depending on people traveling or not. So all of this, it brings an element of a variability. And uh, when we go back in 2010, that were the early days uh, of big data. So as a, as, a, as a planner, as a project manager, I had few vendors coming to me and say, well, the solution is in the big data. And I felt uh, I need to know more. And so I go, went back to, to study. I've joined the Dama UK, the data association management. I returned to, to some of these names during, uh, during our time together tonight. And um, during that, uh, I have studied, certified, I followed a few master, and I become specialized in data management. And that was the first thing that occurred in that time. The second thing is uh, also that I started to, to work in this field. So I've started, I set up a company working in data management as a consulting and training. And, um, and I also start to, to do some research program with MIT, as well as with the London Business School of Economics and with the SDA Bocconi in Italy. So I've started to develop my academia uh, background. And uh, the third thing, and probably most important thing that occurred during that time, I met my wife. I met what was going to become my wife, who whilst love traveling around the world following this mega event, wanted to come back. To, to Italy, where I'm currently, uh, uh, where, where I am at the moment, and I'm still commuting between London and Italy, and I currently have my family in here. So why I told you this story is uh, not to, to speak about myself, but it's just to give you an idea how the, what an element as data was always with me in my career, and there was just a certain point in time where this became my profession. So I wasn't born a data engineer, I wasn't born a data scientist. I didn't study an ICT background, but it was a different path that brought me where, where, I'm, where I am today. And uh, what I wanted to, to discuss over the next uh, 40 minutes together uh, is a little bit about data management, some of the myths around the data management, and also looking about some of the trends from the different hat, different perspective. As I mentioned, I'm collaborating with a few academies. I'm collaborating with the United Nations. I'm the president of the Italian Data Management Association. So I have different perspectives. So I will try during this presentation to tell you some of the trends that I could uh, capture that I, I can from my perspective are the upcoming or some that is already becoming obsolete. And then I will want to talk uh, to you, share with you some of the international framework. I won't speak about the Institute of Information Management, not to disrespect that, but just because you know more about it than myself. So I, I wouldn't want to tell, tell you something you already know, you know better than me. So I will tell you about the other frameworks out there. And then leaving at the end, uh, depending on your, your time and interest, uh, to some Q&A, so I would be happy to explore. If you want also during the session to write your question in the chat, if I'm able, I will try to pick them up while we are talking. Otherwise, we will have time at the end of the session for it. So let's start with some data management uh, myths and trends. 
we are now back in 2000, uh, 2000, 2009, where the economist had this image, this picture on their front page. And uh, the, the economist is quite a well-renowned magazine. And the subtitle or to this picture was, data is the new oil. Now, this uh, sentence is already more than 10 years old. But what did people wanted to say when they said the data is the new oil? Well, they just wanted to stress the importance of data. data. Was, uh, sorry, uh, I see someone talking. I don't know if that was. Uh, please go ahead, go ahead, please go ahead. All right, all right. So, what they meant by data is the new oil. Well, the oil, as we know, independent about sustainable energy, et cetera, et cetera, it is the vital fuel for our society. And uh, data, in that perspective, 10 years ago was considered the new oil. So the new uh, fuel for all our businesses. So these were really the early, early days. We were not talking about the digital transformation. We were not talking about data-driven company. We were just literally at the base and say, data is everywhere, is important, is a resource. Every business is built and needs to use data. So we start with this data is the new oil. And funny enough, what's happened after the years, a lot of papers came out to say data is not the new oil. And why they were saying that? Well, rightly or wrongly, what they wanted to say with all those papers was to say, it is true data is very important. It is vital asset for any company. However, is a very unique asset. It is a repeatable. So multiple parties could use the same asset, the same data simultaneously. You can use it without depleting. It. It's not like other uh, physical asset that you use, you, you ruin them while using them. Data can be used. Data can be stolen and still be used by the original party. So all of this were the things that people were saying, well, it is not the new oil, it is not the new oil. So, Independently, if you like to say data is the new oil, or if you prefer to say data is not the new oil, the key point is data is a vital asset of every company, of our society, and uh, it, it is fundamental, even more so today. So everybody agrees with uh, this first statement. So when you start to look about what it is data, well, the, the word data itself starts from uh, datum, which is Latin for fact, for fact, for instances. And data is the plural of the word datum. But uh, when you are more a little bit go to over this first, uh, uh, first definition, and there is also a cycle of definition that says a data is just, uh, data only becomes important when it is put into context. So uh, 15 is data, but it doesn't really tell you anything. If you start to say it's 15 degrees Celsius, which is into content, you start to provide some information. And even more so when you start to say there is 15 degrees Celsius outside today and it's likely to rain, well, this is becoming some knowledge where you can take decision upon it. So you can decide to take the umbrella or put a coat or put a jumper or not. So this is a little bit what we talk about data. But when you are thinking about what people have in mind about data, usually it is about uh, um, data that you manage, that is structured data. You think about your uh, spreadsheet, you think about numbers, so you, you think uh, uh, about uh, spreadsheet. However, when you look at it, this is literally, usually the 20% of the data available because there is also a word that is the word of unstructured data. The information in your email, the information, the video image, the information in your picture, the metadata connected to the picture, where the picture was taken, or how long uh, the picture will last. And it is also about uh, the recording. So all, all of this information is the unstructured data, is the vast majority of the data that is out there. And importantly, when we say out there, usually in a company, when you are working in any kind of organization, this being a production company, an automation, is uh, oil and gas, is uh, government, it doesn't really matter. Usually you only produce 20% of the data that you are using or you could use. So there is also a word that is the 
information outside the one you are generating. So again, think about the weather condition, weather condition, the data about weather condition is outside probably from the organization you're running, but may have an impact if you work in the logistics or in the great distribution, etc. Why I'm saying all of this is because these two concepts are key. So the fact that data is not only structured data, but is also unstructured data is the first concept. The second concept is unstructured data is much more than the st structured data. And the data you generate, you organize, and you probably have data management program or a data governance office in your organization tend to look at a minority of the data you could look at. So this is a little bit some clarification, which is very important when you manage the data itself, or you start a data-driven or a data or a digital uh, transformation program. So there is unstructured data. So what's happened to the unstructured data? Well, as we, we, we are all smart, we are all familiar with this concept of unstructured data, we have a solution for it. We know what we need to do with this unstructured data. And what we need to do is to get a data scientist. And here we start to move into the world of uh, into dreamland in terms of data scientists. I put in here, and I, I, I'm aware you cannot read the details, but when we you will have an opportunity to see the slides after this uh, made, you can see the profile of a data scientist, which I found. Uh, I, I can't remember this one if it was a Stanford University research or pro profiling. Anyway, the, the source is at the bottom. So what is a, who is a data scientist? Is, a, is the person that manage unstructured data, work with unstructured data. This is fine. But what else is a data scientist? All right, the standard salary for, from this survey, from this study, it speaks about someone that is uh, roughly 120,000 uh, US dollars per year. It's good salary, very good salary. It usually has, as a minimum a master degree, more likely to have two master degree or more or have a PhD. Even a fascinating is obviously has a lot of skills set in the analytics, is also a good programmer, but even more so is a good communicator. And surprise, surprise, all of these uh, characteristics are the feature of someone that usually is in between the age of 25 to 30 years old. So here is the paradox. You are expecting that someone that has probably at the beginning of his career already has, uh, and, and you pay him a lot for this career is in high demand. Now we have almost an issue in terms of the market at for data scientists, because everybody wants a data scientist because everybody recognizes there are data to be managed. Unfortunately, they want a lot from this person. And here is uh, from, from uh, the, the, the other part of this story, which is utopic in one end to look for such a complete profile at such an early age and to pay so much and to pre pretty much create a bubble in the market. But the second thing is that what the work that this data scientist is going to do. Well, what the data scientist is going to do, this is an MIT study that was originally run in 2015, run again in 2019, exactly the same uh, outcome. In between 90 and 95% of the time of a data scientist is occupied, is spent in cleaning data. The remaining of his time, and between uh, five and uh, eight percent of his time is about preparing data. And only two percent or a very minority of his time is doing adding value. So it is analyzing data, is providing a report, is providing what is paid for. So this is the paradox where we are currently today. We have uh, moved from uh, database, SQL uh, server, to data warehouses, uh, to data lake, and uh, the data lake have become very quickly data dump. So pretty much you have start to throw everything in there, not considering the importance of metadata of traditional data and, uh, and task someone, a data scientist to, to fix it all. And this person is pretty much spending all of his time and all of your money because of the company or that run this thing to clean the data, which is you wouldn't need half of uh, all that specialistic uh, task or that requirement because it's what tradition was doing, probably a junior analyst or a data engineer back in the day. So this is a little bit of a myth and, and a warning. Be careful when you look for data scientists. I'm very vocal on this topic because there is a lot of students, a lot of young people out there that are going kind of misled or trapped into this 
studies how to become a data scientist how can i get the most has been named by the Wall Street Journal, the most fashionable work of the 20th century to become a data scientist. So all these expectations on these guys that are studying and investing their money and time to end up doing cleaning spreadsheet on, uh, on, on, some, probably, uh, on some probably legacy system. So this is a little bit uh, of a warning, but let's move now about uh, some of the trends as well and some of the other concepts. One of the trends that we are uh, uh, seeing more recently, I would say in the last 24 months, a couple of years, is the data mesh. Data mesh is, uh, uh, I don't know if you have read the book, there is this manual from Zamak de Hangani that uh, I think is a 2020 or 2019 publication. And in very simplistic terms, it refers to what into traditional data management terms is uh, federated data governance and a metadata repository or a basic data factory or data market so so what is a fascinating about this concept and uh, probably i need to skip to the next slide and well i will show you in the next slide a, a chart from gartner it is interesting because the concept which is a fascinating everybody and if you are going out of the market now either you are a vendor or you are a client or you are a government or you are a university you will hear a lot about this data mesh. Well, the surprise on this is data mesh as a concept has been in existence for the last 10, 15 years. In terms of federated data governance, very well known concept and very well known and, and distributed. Everybody talked about and documented there are books that speaks about this concept for the last 10 years. And the data marketplace just think uh, in concept, in, in data management terms, we refer to that as a metadata repository where, which everybody can access to it. If you wanna call it a data marketplace, you just need to think about something like Amazon. So we are talking about the Amazon of data. This is where everybody can access, can buy a report, can buy data set, can buy inverted commas, can access to it. So this concept of uh, delegating authority, giving open access to the information in an easy interface, is the core of what data mesh this book report i'm not saying this is um, this is right or wrong i'm just saying there is quite a it's quite a buzz at the moment everybody is fascinated about be careful this has been in existence for long long time so it's not something new and what i'm saying i will show it to you in one slide because gartner came to the same conclusion so what i'm all the thing i'm saying apart from me my experience i'm also trying to bring to you some experience from study, research, et cetera, that uh, we are uh, either collaborating or we have been informed by. So let's continue. Another trend, so I want to now move from what are these myths about uh, resolving all the problem in the world to, to some real trend, such as the data mesh. Another trend is the infonomics. Infonomics, it is about the economy of data. This book has been written by the who was then the VP of Gartner Research in Data, uh, Doug Laney, or Douglas Laney. And uh, Doug has since moved out from, uh, from uh, Gartner. But what the, this book is speaking about is about how do you measure the economical value of data, of the data asset. And when you think about this is then is measuring it, is potentially monetizing it, is not always monetizing. Monetizing is a concept of purchase. So is a, there is someone selling, there is someone buying, and there is an economic value to it. That is not the only value. There can be value in brokerage. There can be value that you use your data set or a report that you can run from your data that you can share for better a vendor a service level agreement. So there are various ways you can use the value of the data. But the importance of this book, it is it has given a, a value. Obviously, it's not in the balance sheet. So regulation, as often happen, is far below behind what is technology and what is uh, the science. So, but it will come. It will come. It's like intellectual property. It is an intangible asset. It's very difficult to to put a value to it. Classical uh, example that we always bring in our classes. What is the value of the Nike logo, of the Coca-Cola logo? Well, difficult to measure. It doesn't mean it doesn't have a value. And same thing you can apply for data. So 
just consider this is going to happen. Someone one day will have the data asset in their balance sheet and they will have accountant to do it and we'll have internal audit to look at it. So or internal or external auditor to look at it. So there's one of the other trends we are looking at. And the last I wanted to bring today was about uh, uh, sustainability. Obviously, uh, you may or may not be familiar with the uh, United Nations Agenda 2030. I did mention I'm collaborating with them. The United uh, uh, is the Sustainable Agenda has developed 12 sustainable, de sustainable development goals that need to be achieved by 2030. Now, what all of this bring, when you bring this concept into practice, it brings it to the uh, balance, to the sustainable balance, sustainability balance, which is one requirement that most company will be asked to provide. So you, as you have your balance sheet, your end of the year account, you will be asked about your sustainability for the year. And this is not only the carbon footprint, obviously is everything about sustainability. And the important key, uh, the important aspect of this sustainable sustainability movement it is that all this information will need to be created, will need to be populated by a data. So what are the data? What are the indicators that will help you to comply with the sustainability reporting requirement? Just be aware, this is, again is a, a trend we already seen. There are, uh, there are different government bodies, a think tank, uh, association, cooperation, they are looking into it, but it's coming. Again, we cannot expect that these, and this coming fast, because let's remember 2030 is in eight years time. So the first report are probably, we are talking in less than 12 months, we will start to, to look at this kind of report from the major companies and from uh, government, et cetera. So the data to support the sustainability revolution is, uh, is one of the new trends we are seeing uh, company uh, focusing on. Now, I just wanted to put you this. This is probably a refer to what I was telling you before. And I tried to put my pointer on. OK. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, 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 the Gartner curve. But the Gartner curve very basically speaks. Uh, there is an element of innovation where the technology is, is uh, ramping up. And there are a lot of expectation with this new innovation. There is then a peak of inflated expectations where Expectations were probably too high and uh, the technology wasn't there yet. So there is kind of top of the expectation before it goes down to what is called as the throw of disillusionment or the valley of disillusionment because the high expectation were not satisfied. This doesn't mean technology wasn't good. We are not talking about technology wasn't good. It's just that the, the expectation were higher than what the technology could support. After this moment of disenchantment, it is moving into the slope of enlightenment, which means uh, probably technology is picking up, expectations are rebalanced, and you start to see the real result up to the point where is the plateau of productivity. This is the moment where really the society, the company can really benefit from some of these uh, new technology. Now, on this report, uh, it does provide uh, some uh, where the technology or discipline of data management are. And what you can see, which is quite a fascinating, I thought, and if we have time at the end, I would like to have your views about it, is the data mesh, which is still an innovation, is a trigger, again, is considered an early, an early technology, is an innovation technology, is an innovation way to do things, is already considered obsolete, which is quite a fascinating because you would expect something to become obsolete after a longer period of time, not all technology have all this journey, but you would expect a, a different, a different uh, path. Now, on this, I need to put a caveat. You may agree with the Gartner report. You may disagree with it. I'm not uh, taking any part on this discussion. I'm just saying on some of these myths, such as the data mesh that everybody's speaking about, there are also other people that are not so enthusiastic about, and those people are uh, uh, reputable. Uh, organizations such as the Gardner organization. So what I would like now to, to, to continue is a little bit about this meet. So we talk about buzzword. Let, actually, let's talk about buzzword. We have already touched on the data lake. The data lake, as mentioned, is uh, the so technolo technological solution to 
use both uh, structure and structured data. Big data, the three Vs of data, the five Vs of data, everybody comes with a, a, a definition. Interesting, I did mention before, Doug Laney, the father of infonomics, is also the inventor, if we can call it like that, of the three Vs for big data. So about velocity, about variety, it's about volume. So big data is when you have a lot more data, is of different structure, and is produced more rapidly than ever in the past. This is kind of basic definition of big data. And big data is now sounds already very old. People were talking about big data 10 years ago. I told you my story about the Olympics because in 2010, when I was asking, how would I know how many, um, uh, 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 how, uh, how to plan for uh, how many police officers I should put in between the tube station and the start of the, of the gate of the park, Vendors were coming to me and say, we will give you the exact answer because we can use big data. Well, surprise, surprise, that hasn't happened. We are still, big data is not the response to every issue around that. And then there is uh, the other two biggies, which are machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now people have started to say, it doesn't matter that data management, data quality, metadata, the governance of data, it's not relevant, that architecture, data modeling, all of these things, you don't need them anymore because now you have machine learning. And machine learning, even more so, can uh, alimentate the in artificial intelligence. So you don't need to take care about uh, those basic boring stuff as data cleansing and data quality principle because the machine will do everything. Well, surprise, surprise, it hasn't happened. It doesn't happen that way because the old paradigm of Garbage in, garbage out is still exactly the same. Technology hasn't changed that fact that if you want to drive your organization by good decision based on data, you need good data. And good data needs to follow good data management principles. This has been proven and proven and proven again. So you don't need to trust what I'm saying. It's just what everybody is saying. Apart from the vendors, well, vendors have a different view. And not because they are bad people, it's just because they have different agenda in mind. And, uh, and advanced analytics, but I come back in advanced analytics with this next slide. So my comment in here is just be very, technology doesn't fix the data issue. You still need good data management to fix the data issue or to take advantage from data. So be careful with the buzzword. Now, just a chart to show you, apologies, some of it is written in Italian, but I, I'm, I'm sure you can, uh, it's not so dissimilar to English. What I wanted to show you in this chart, and is just to reinforce what I was just telling you earlier. Now, what you have in here is the level of automation of the process. And on the vertical axis, you have the level of good data, let's say. So in a simplistic terms, good volume and quality of data. This is what this vertical axis is all about. So when you think about static report, which pretty much is telling you what has occurred in the past, what you usually have is low level of uh, uh, automation. You are in the world of business intelligence. So usually the standard data warehouse with the business intelligence on the top, this being customized, this being Power BI, being Click, be any of the market out there. Usually what you are able to do is to, to look at the past. And to looking at the past, you still have quite a lot of uh, manual work to do. And you can only ask two questions is what has occurred and why has occurred. So all this dashboard and KPIs is only telling you about the history. And is, if they are good, it's telling you why certain things have occurred. But then let's move into advanced analytics. And this is what honestly, what people want because it's very interesting to know that yesterday was raining uh, in Nairobi. Very important, very interesting information, but what I really want to know is what is going to occur tomorrow. So when you moved into this world of the future, you move into what is, are known as the advanced analytics. Advanced analytics have uh, the characteristic of telling you to be predictive, to be prescriptive, or to be automated. And what these three words mean, one is tell you what is going to happen, the prescriptive analytics are starting to produce recommendations, tell you, well, if this is going to happen, this is what you potentially should do. 
tomorrow is going to rain, you may want to take an umbrella. This is the move. Up to the point of automation, this is decision automate. So it's not asking the human intervention anymore. We are moving into fully into the automatic decision process. And this is all about the driving uh, and uh, automation, automatic drive, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why I'm showing you this chart is the chart I'm showing for one important thing is because going from bottom to up, everybody wants advanced analytic, but be, you need to be aware that to get into the upper level, data management and data quality has to increase. You cannot disregard that you cannot expect to have prescriptive or predictive analytics if your data management is like a pyramid. You want to have the peak of that iceberg, but you need everything underneath for that peak to be accurate and to, to, to work fine. So my message in here again is data management has not to disappear. Information management is still important. Technology won't solve you your problem. Technology will help you. Our enablers are important tools, but it's not the response. The response is always good data management. And on this thought, I just move to the next part of the presentation, which are these international framework, some of the international framework and some of the international data community out there. So let's start with one which is very close to my heart because I've been part of it for over a decade now. Uh, the data association management has been uh, founded in 1980. So when you think about it, it's more than 40 years. So everybody's talking about data now and it seems to be a new discipline. It is 40 years old as a minimum. And we are not talking about IT, we are talking about data management. So the data association management founded in 1980 in Los Angeles has been mostly US centric for the last um, two or three decades, but is growing and growing and growing much, much faster now in the EMEA region, European, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. In terms of we have roughly half a million individual members uh, uh, enrolled to the EMEA association in Europe or in EMEA, sorry, which is the area uh, uh, the Alexander that introduced me earlier did mention that I'm the president of the Italian Data Management Association and the, the Italian Data Management Association is affiliated to the International. In addition, I'm also the VP responsible for the EMEA region. So I, let me tell you a little bit about my region, which uh, we are currently counting 15,000 mem corporate members. We count roughly 400 companies associated to it, and we are present in over 20 countries. And whilst I love to say EMEA, reality, we are speaking mostly about Europe, because in Africa, we only have a couple of uh, states which are covered. It's Botswana, it's Kenya that are working on it. Egypt has just recently joined. The Middle East has recently joined. Saudi, Dubai, Qatar, Istanbul. And South Africa is the, the chapter that has been for longer active. But most of the European countries are COVID. And again, I think the trend is important because from a US-centric company, we are becoming a real global company. Now, what about DEMA? DEMA has uh, three key assets. The first asset is the community. I told you a little bit about the numbers, what are globally and what are in the EMEA region. The second asset uh, is uh, this 40 years experience uh, have not gone lost. This 30 years experience have crystallized in a book. This book or what is called body of knowledge is uh, what uh, I'm projecting here. It's called the DAMA data management body of knowledge. It is current is 650 pages uh, long and it provides the best practice knowledge expertise of all these uh, people over the last 40 years have gathered in here crystallized in this document this document is currently in its second version and uh, it has been translated in seven or eight languages uh, at the moment I, I don't remember exactly but what i wanted to tell you is uh, what the what is the framework of the Framework of DEMA recognizes 11 knowledge areas or 11 topics that form data management. So when you talk about data management, it's not to be confused with what is data governance, with what is data security, what it is reference and master data management, is about document control, all those Excel spreadsheets you have, all the library, all the physical 
document you have, all that needs to be managed as well. He speaks about data modeling, conceptual data modeling, physical data modeling, logistic data modeling. He speaks about data architecture. We, you may have or may not have heard about the Zachman framework. We speak about the enterprise uh, architecture, IT in, in uh, uh, IT uh, architecture, but it's also about data architecture. And then you speak about data quality. Data quality is very interesting. Everybody knows when data is not of good quality. And another interesting thing, everybody wants good data quality. What is very difficult is to say what the good data quality means. So what is data quality for you? And again, this is the second question I would like to discuss later. Then I give you the answer that DEMA provides and that we think. But what is good data quality? Is 22 good or is 22 point dot, 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 dot good? I don't know. Is uh, a data every hour good or a data every minute good? I don't know. Should data be stored for one day, one year? Illimited. Again, don't know. But that is what data quality, we need to, to define what good data quality means. So, and then metadata, that is data about the data. And interesting, data governance is at the center of it and keeps everything together. So this is our second asana, as I explained a little bit. Again, if you have any question about what, uh, I'm happy to deep dive as much as you want in this, but let me just give you an overview now. The third thing that DEMA does, the third asset, community, framework, or body of knowledge, certification. DEMA has today the oldest and more widely recognized professional certification in data management. This certification is called CDMP, Certified Data Management Profession. For those of you that know the Project Management Institute and the PMP, we are exactly the same for data management. Very similar organization as well. They're both from US, so they have a similar kind of governance. There is the CDMP is the certification that certify you know all of these things. And there are different levels. You can be associate, you can become practitioner and then become a master. Personally, I'm, I'm, I'm a trainer for these things, but uh, the important, you also have specialization exams. So you can become a specialist in data security, in data storage, in data modeling, data governance, et cetera. So this is just one of the framework. It is not the only framework. It is the one, I, again, I'm the president for Italy, EMEA coordinator, but we, there are also other frameworks out there. So let's go and look at it. Uh, the second framework is the one provided by the EDM Council. EDM Council started by John Bottega, that by the Wall Street Journal is the first uh, um, CDO of Wall Street was defined. So interesting definition. What uh, John Bottega did uh, coming from uh, an, um, a bank background, and, and now this just now that I recall, I remember that we interviewed, uh, I had a panel discussion, I moderated a panel discussion probably last year uh, at the uh, MIT symposium. I remember your president, the Honorable um, Oye, was, uh, was in the panel. So he was the president of DAMA International, he was the president of the M Council, and also your president was there on that, uh, on that specific day, on that specific session. Um, anyway. What I wanted to discuss about uh, or share with you about the EDM Council, they have a very different point of uh, starting point. DEMA looks at individuals, mostly at individuals. It does provide instrument and tools uh, how to do things, uh, but it is not uh, a uh, manual that you, you buy, read, and you, and you do data management. It is not an instruction manual, it is, 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 is a body of knowledge, it is an academic manual. And this is focused for individual. Certification is for people, for person. It's for people to say, yes, I'm good. I know I'm good. I've been working data management 10 years, 15 years, and now I have certification to, to recognize that, which is recognized globally. The EDM has done something different. They are speaking to companies and they are speaking from a specific perspective, which is what is your data management maturity? So what they have developed is an instrument kind of, now uh, apologies, I oversimplify and uh, please forget what I'm saying, but it's a kind of magnified checklist of demand that you can assess your level or the company maturity level in terms of data management. And in order to do so, you need to develop a structure. You cannot ask random questions. 
And so in order to do so, they have developed what they call uh, the DCAM data capability assessment model. And this uh, circle is called the DCAM Frisbee, where this is the Dama wheel, this is the DCAM Frisbee. And as you can see, there are some similarities. So you have an element of data strategy in business case, the foundation, the second foundation is data management program and have the funding to do the things. Thanks. Then, then the, I don't know if there was a, a question, but uh, I continue if you don't uh, ask me otherwise, say otherwise. Then there is an execution element, which is about business and data architecture, data and technology, data quality and data governance. And the last layer, which is a data control environment, which brings all things together. Now, what is fascinating about, there are over 300 companies which are EVM council member and they use this framework. The last four companies that I think have joined are companies such as uh, AstraZeneca, that you may have heard from the pharmaceutical and from the pandemia, is uh, McDonald, is uh, Amazon, and it is IBM. IBM. Why I'm saying this name is just because there are very important companies that believe that this is a good system. It's not Nino telling you it is an important framework. 300 companies all over the globe, all the major companies you can think of are probably using this system. And again, there is a, a training for how to use it, et cetera, et cetera. And again, if you want to know more, happy to. The thing I put it down here is uh, just roughly, it is very new is very new because where DCAM has been in existence for, I think, over 10 years, there is also a version for the cloud. And what it does mean, it does mean, it does, it's not a manual how to move to the cloud. It only say this a maturity assessment if you are ready to, to manage data in the cloud, in hybrid cloud, so server and cloud, so on-premises and cloud, or in multi-cloud. So you may have cloud into a country, another cloud in another country, et cetera, et cetera, and cloud sovereignty. So I don't get into those details, but they have also developed this system, which is very interesting. And if you want later, we can speak about it. What I told you so far are very structured scheme, very complex, very important, very relevant, developed over and over the years. But I also wanted to give you some word of hope in terms of there is also what uh, uh, something much easier. The non-invasive data governance is a book that has been written by Rob Siner or Bob Siner. And uh, I, I had the pleasure to, 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 to work on the Italian uh, version of this book. But what this book is, is probably 150 pages, is telling you that probably every day you are already doing some sort of governance of data. Probably it's very unstructured. Probably you don't even know that you are doing it, but you're already doing it. And the basic of this uh, model is document what you are already doing. It sounds very simple. It sounds very logical. Not everybody does it. So kind of the, the starting point is you're already doing it. Document what you're doing, and then you start to see what you're not doing, et cetera, et cetera. Why I wanted to share this is because it's a very light approach. I respect what are very complex approach. And when we talk about light or complex, I bring you another system that this is uh, here, uh, uh, the disclaimer. I'm working for one of these, for the fit strategy company. I'm collaborating with any, with all these companies, but I wanted to say, I wanted to produce this, this is another framework that's been recently developed. And obviously we, we believe into this framework and it builds on pretty much all the other that we have just shown you. So what it does say, is say, if you wanna develop a data management program, unfortunately you need all of these things. You cannot just do data modeling without thinking about security. You cannot do this if you don't have a data warehouse or business intelligence or a technology. You cannot do this if you don't think about data quality. So what do you do? You start with a multi-year, multi-million, billion, or whatever it costs, sterling US dollars of investment because it's very complex. You need a lot of commitment. You need a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of patience, and senior management really committed. And probably the first result are coming in two, three, five years time. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's absolutely up perfectly fine, but you need to have that culture. And not many companies have that culture and that patience and that commitment from senior management team to invest money, time, resource without seeing early results. 
On the other end, on the other side of the spectrum, you have the non-invasive data governance as well. Just document what you have. It's very light, it's very easy, it's quick. Okay, but when you work in a bank or you work in a, in a banking sector, a highly regulated sector, government sector, probably this is not enough. So what we are come about is with this process that brings a little bit together and is pretty much the painting by number. I don't know if you have ever played when you were a kid about this. This is, the idea is you have a map, you have numbers and numbers are related to color and you start and color first all the numbers of a certain color. And then you move to another number of another color, et cetera, et cetera. The problem about doing it like that is like this system where you all start first define all the role of that governance, all the policies about that governance, all the procedure about that governance, and it takes a time. Or you could do for mission critical data or for data which you have issue with because are uh, important because are in your, in your annual report, because are important because it's the one where you spend more time and to fix it, or is important for any other reason because it's a differentiator on the mark. So you start to focus on that and pretty much what you do, you start to do a little bit of all of this. You probably start to model the data, see the architecture around what are the system where this data move, a little bit of data lineage, about a little bit of data profiling. You start to define indicators for that specific, quality indicators for that specific data. You start to run a report that it tells you about. You start to look if you want to run a report, what metadata you need for that uh, report, for instance, or to use that data. Who is using that data? Is a secure data, is confidential, is private? You start to speak a little bit about the privacy element. Now, I don't tell you the whole story, obviously. What I'm trying to say is you start small and touch every data management discipline. And this gives you a couple of good things. You, first of all, you see a result much, much sooner and you don't need to invest a lot of money. You ever also, if you had a critical data that has an issue, you fix that data. So you start to have some result early on. You also, very important, start to understand data management. You start to familiarize with it. You start, when you paint, you start to become better at painting. You start to understand the different color and then you can replicate and expand. So this is what we call the painting by number framework. And I should have said, you always start with a maturity assessment because a maturity assessment, independent if you do the DCAM, if you do it based on DEMA, or if you do it, we have our own uh, way to do it. It tells you where to start. So before saying, I want to do it on this business unit, on this business, on this data, et cetera, that this give you very good indicators. So my, again, you can start wherever you want. You start with a pilot, you start with a full program. My preference is almost most of the time is to start with an assessment, which could be very deep, could be very light, independent, but it gives you some flavor and some good information. Then the last, uh, uh, which is not a framework as such, but are we talking about data management community? It is about MIT and the CDOIQ, which uh, is a research program that is uh, now uh, 16 or 17 year, so it's almost 20 years old. And every year culminate with a symposium, uh, always sourced by, it, it started with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Richard Wang was the, 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 the founder and is still the executive director for it. I had the pleasure of collaborating on the com symposium committee and research program since uh, uh, 2019, I think three years now, three or four years. And uh, this is not a framework as such is a very important symposium, is becoming a community, is becoming an event where you want to be. And again, I, you are well represented in that. I, I don't want to do any spoilers, so I, I will leave the word to, to, to your president later who he, he can comment. Another very interesting thing that the CDOIQ does have an ambassador program. And again, I know you are, uh, some of you are ambassador for this program. So. Again, I don't, I don't want to speak for others. If you want, we can speak uh, later about what, uh, what this program is. And uh, I think that was all what I wanted to share uh, with you to, today. I just finish uh, with two things. One, I didn't speak about the Institute of Information Management, your certification, etc. Again, not for disrespect, it's just because yeah, you don't come to an Italian to tell him how to do pizza. So you know how to do it. You know that much better than me. So 
this is just this is the reason why it hasn't been mentioned. To resume, there is a lot. Data is an important asset, is a vital asset. A lot of people recognize now that it is important. Unfortunately, there is a lot of noise around data, a lot of buzzwords, machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, whatever you want to call it. There is quite a lot out there. So be careful that a lot of these are vendor led or are some thought leader that think about it. Unfortunately, machine data management is a business discipline. It's not an IT discipline. It's a business thing. You need, is your company that need to decide if they want to be led by data or not. It's not a decision that is an IT decision, what machine you use. You need to decide where you want to go. Then the machine can bring you there, but you still need to have a good driver. You need to still to know how to drive. And this is not different. The good, the, the good thing is, you're not alone. You're not starting from scratch. There are people that have studied this discipline for the last 40 years. There are good manual. There is good education. There is training. There are certification. There are tools that you could use to do it. And uh, with this, I just wanted to, to complete thanking you again for, for having me. And uh, I don't know how we are doing with time, but uh, if you have any question, uh, I put there my contact if you want to reach out even outside from this webinar to, to know more about it. And I also put my LinkedIn profile if you want to, to connect. I, I'm always happy to, to, to reach out to other people with similar minded people. So thank you. Any question? OK. Um, you know, thank you so much for the, that presentation. Um, we appreciate the, the presentation. Just um, to mention, we can go back, take your slide back to where you have the PDO data management framework, right? So um, I think the need for us to understand what are the various um, the, uh, data management framework before we start, start moving towards compliance, right? Uh, because institute information management is actually, is actually um, we Dama Dama is also um, a partner with the institute, right? Um, also, the International University of Information Management that we have in the, in the US, we deliver data management courses there. So, um, just to throw more insight, which one should come first? Prepare for data protection compliance. You know, we have all the uh, regulations all over the world now. We have the GDPR, which is the common one. We now have the, our Nigerian and uh, data protection regulation. We have the LGBAs, we have the CCPAs. Um, we have so many countries that have the data protection um, laws and act. The first step before you start thinking about, because it's difficult to start implementing the regulatory compliance because the starting point really is for one to have the data management um, framework in place then now work towards achieving compliance. What do you have to say about that, Nino? Okay, thank you, Alexander, for the question. I, I think I will need to answer in two, well, I give you a couple of, uh, I don't have the, the, the answer, I, I tell you my, my views about it. Now, when you speak about the regulation, some regulation, be aware that are written by people probably coming from some of this framework. And why I'm telling you about uh, a regulation I know pretty well, well, apart from GDPR, which I know pretty well, but uh, because it was collaborating with the Basel II committee that uh, developed it. But the NDMO, which is the government, uh, the Saudi Arabia uh, data management framework is built on this. They pretty much take the, took the DMBOK and they said, all right, we want to create a framework that everybody needs to comply, every government, every ministry in Saudi need to comply, any agency, government agency needs to comply to this uh, framework, to this regulation. So in here, obviously, the answer is that is almost one to one. They have started from DEMA, so I would say, well, this is the one you need to go to. However, I don't think there is one fit all response. Because a lot of, I think it at a certain moment, you need all of these things. 
you need to do a data maturity as a before you can say i'm complying with gdpr you need to understand what are you doing what, what, how you are doing where where your data is and how you do that well a way is a, what we call a data capability assessment data maturity assessment is asking the question in a structured way say do, do we have a, a data security policy that question you need to ask now you, you you can arrive to that because you have studied you have done it you you want to invent is already out there use one of these systems one is you will need to understand a little bit more again if it's ndmo is built on this use them but you could use the dcam one it really depends a little bit where you are looking is government or say speaking again about the regulation again i think the the, the important bit is that uh, you need to understand uh, a little bit data management so i think whatever system you start studying i'm sure you the the, the manual you're writing the course you are running are, are good teaching so i just invite people to 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 familiarize with the concept familiarize with the with the regulation then the system you use it will really depend on uh, uh, regulation for, for privacy again if you speak about data privacy isaka i haven't mentioned in here he started uh, uh, with uh, from from auditors and is very looking at that specific asset. So that could be a probably a better response. Sorry, I I think I gave you views rather than a proper response. I think in a short line, it depends. It depends what the regulation is. A probably a mix of all these uh, tool can provide you your your uh, your answer always start in my opinion with an assessment with a maturity assessment a, ma a capability assessment because those things are telling you are snapshot is telling you where you are then you can decide where you want to be and it could be that uh, you have three objects you can be i just want to be compliant and the good thing is you will be compliant the problem with it is probably you will only be compliant or you can say i want to be more than compliant i want to i want to be proactive i want to go over what the compliance is telling me well and then probably if you aspire higher you get further down so i don't want to be sounded too disillusioned or too, too aspirational here but be careful about only be compliant is a requirement fine but if you want to be compliant the maximum you obtain is to be compliant you want to probably become a data-driven company and i'm not saying everybody needs to become a data-driven company but uh, if you want to be data-driven you need to look at data driven you don't need only to look about compliance compliance is one requirement you also need to look higher than that okay um thank you very much um i think uh, i've checked the the message chat system seems not to find any there are no questions on the chat so uh, I think we'll move to the next point. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Nino, for that. Okay, um, not to wait most of our time, and um, I would like to call on the Mr. President if you have anything that you want to add or anything you want to yeah, before I move to the next section. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Nago. Thank you, Nino. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we're glad to have you at least uh, for us to have a feel of what is happening, you know, talking about your own end of the world. Um, it's really good. It's insightful. And I think, um, you know, the presentation is explicit enough, you know, for us to be able to see how things, you know, have been done in other parts of the world. And I, I, I see us doing a lot together in terms of, uh, you know, our best practices and sharing knowledge and, uh, uh, you know, lessons learned too. Because um, uh, like they say, a tree cannot make a forest. There is always need for us to all come together, you know, work together and um, ensure that um, we make our industry, you know, a force to be reckoned with because, um, Probably, I, I think it's the same scenario in Europe and America uh, when we talk generally about data management and information management, um, the, the level of, um, 
you know, recognition, if we talk about recognition now, um, you know, people are just beginning to see the need to ensure that, you know, their hope and doing in managing data and information within the organizations and also, you know, tapping into the uh, various opportunities being provided by data, you know, in decision making, it's not just about making decisions, but making quality decisions and the role that data has uh, got to play, you know, in this ecosystem. So um, this is just the beginning. Um, we still, we have so many things to do, so many things to achieve, you know, the awareness need to keep increasing because uh, what I personally think is lacking is awareness. A lot of organizations, if you ask them, they believe uh, data is important, information is important. But if you ask them about their budget in a year, you hardly get to see, most especially in our own climate, you hardly get to see organizations and even government putting enough in terms of financing, you know, into data management. And I think, you know, if you continue at this pace and we continue to raise the awareness, it's really going to go a long way in helping organizations to see the need for them to be more actively involved, you know, in um, ensuring that data becomes an asset that is recognized. Uh, because most of them would prefer physical assets, you know, that they can actually see. And when you talk about data being an asset to some of them, you know, you, it's almost like an Herculean task for you to convince an organization why they need to invest this much into data management. So, you know, it's um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not something we can achieve within this very short time. It's going to be a continuous thing. And just like you mentioned about the MIT symposium, I think um, in my professional career so far, I, I don't think I've seen any platform as huge as that platform. It's something and um, it, it's something else. And um, like you mentioned, uh, we've been well, well represented. Even this year, Nigeria was well represented on that platform. And I can assure you that next year is going to be better. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being part of our monthly webinar. I hope when next week I invite you to come on board, you know, to still come and give us talks like this. It's something you gladly and would be looking forward to doing for us. Thank you, Nino. Uh, Mr. Nago, very good job. Well done. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Over to you. Okay, well, thank you so very much, Mr. President. Um, someone says in the in the in the chat, Mr. Sondermoni says it is high time we start to see data as an asset. Yes, that's correct. And that was why I asked the question I asked before, because Compliance has come to say, okay, protect the data. What are the frameworks? What are the standards that we need to put in place to ensure we actually meet the compliance? Because it is not easy to start to meet compliance when you have not set up things that you need to help you to get to that. Everybody said the, the greatest asset now is data. Like um, Nino mentioned, we're looking at oil. Now data is the right thing. Okay, so um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And let us not waste our time. I would like to appreciate um, the various executive council members of the Institute of Information Management for Africa who are here. Uh, I would like you to introduce yourself. But before that, um, you can check the various announcements on the chat box. Um, be posted by Mr. Ezechukwe Jofo. Um, if you need the soft copy, you have to send a mail to the training at I am. Um, Mr. Ezechukwe will send the email address there. For accredited members, you will be you will be communicated to on how to get the soft copy. Most times, if you follow us on Facebook, you are going to see the most of the presentations are published on our Facebook page. You can actually go there and keep watching it. If you are following us on Facebook, you will you get the presentation there okay so um not to wait on our time i would like to start with the the president of the institute please kindly introduce yourself after that we go to princess fafuga and uh, mrs um Yemi Azebube and roda 
Please, Mr. President, please, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you once again, uh, Mr. Nago. I'm Ambassador Dr. Oyedo Kun Oyewole. I'm the President, Chairman, Governing Council of this prestigious institute in Africa. Um, the Institute of Information Management is the premier um, information management institute in Africa. And um, we're proud that within a very short while, we've been able to positively you know, have this outstanding impact on the African continent. And I think uh, for those that are non-members of the Institute that are on this platform tonight, I want to use this opportunity to invite you to join the IM family. We'll be glad and willing to have you on board. Like you've listened to the presentation, data is the new oil. It is the new gold. Data is you know, what any organization, any individual, any nation needs you know, to survive and also to excel. So you're, you are at the right place at the right time you know, for being part of this. And we will want to welcome you fully you know, into the IIM Africa family. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mr. President. I think I need the next person. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. I'm Princess Tiwalade Fakunda, the Vice President of the Institute of Information Management Africa. I bring greetings from myself and from my family from New Jersey, United States of America. This October webinar has, is a great one. You will all agree with me. I thank God Almighty for making it a, a huge success because I we can you will all agree with me that it's a success. We have all learned a lot, and it cannot be possible without the presentation made by the the, the guest speaker of today. So I'm indeed very grateful to our guest speaker Neno for giving us this great, wonderful presentation. Indeed, it has been a superlative and valuable presentation. We have really learned a lot and we have also as well refreshed our memory from what we have learned. We can key into the best practices, sharing knowledge, lesson learned thereabouts. So we are very grateful, Nino. We are really, really grateful. I also want to thank the president for always giving this leadership role. His leadership role has always been consistent and all the ESCO and the entire members of the Institute are really learning a lot from you. I say more, 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 more grace to your elbow. We are very proud of you. And I bring also give great salutation to the to my co-executive members that are here on board. You are all welcome. And to the to our great moderator, Mr. Nago, you did wonderfully well. I, I say bravo to you on a job well done. The technical group crew have done a great job as well. I cannot but also thank everybody present, both members and non-members of the Institute that are part of today's program. I, bring, I, I greet every one of you. You have indeed been an amazing audience and I thank you for listening and for engaging. Once again, I thank you for being part of today's webinar success story. Indeed, I will have like to end by saying Together, we made IIM Africa proud. Up IIM, good night and God bless. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, the next person, I can see Mrs. Eze is here. Hi, hello everyone. Hello. Good evening, good day to everyone for those outside Nigeria. 
And thank you, especially a big thank you to um, our speaker, our guest speaker for today. Uh, we really appreciate your time and sharing of knowledge. Uh, my name is Yemi Ezebube. I'm a fellow of the Institute and a member of the Governing Council. I say a big welcome to everyone and thank you all for participating. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Faraday, I think she she's here, but I don't think she's here. She's having kind of having internet challenges. Faraday. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Nago. Good evening, the old house. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, sure our week has been good. It's nice having everybody on board this evening. My name is uh, Mrs. Rhoda Family, uh, a fellow of the Institute and a secretary to the Governing Council. Uh, I want to say thank you to our speaker, Mr. Nino. You have done very well. Uh, Mr. Nago, thank you for moderating. Uh, just a uh, few information for us. Uh, this weekend uh, is our Portacot induction. As many of us that can be part of that physically and uh, online can join us. Uh, Ghana is also coming up. And uh, in the month of November, we'll be having our national summit in Abuja. Thereafter, we'll be having our UK and US uh, inductions followed by Canada. So we'll keep you posted on our different platforms. Thank you, everybody, for being for be part of tonight's uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the uh, my fellow executive council members. So my name, as you know, is Alexander M. Dosianaga, also on a fellow of the Institute Information Management, executive council member in charge of relations and sponsorship. So we will welcome you for any sponsorship you want to um, have, you want to showcase with the Institute. I will also try to encourage every member, please to follow our handles, the IAM handles we have on our Facebook page, check the chat box. If you want more information, also check us on LinkedIn. We're on LinkedIn, we're on uh, Instagram, we're on Facebook. Like I said, the presentations will be shared, is always shared on Facebook. Every presentation we had every month, you can find it on Facebook. Have all the webinar presentations, they are there, the recordings. Also, um, please, you might have to turn on your cameras for us to take the photograph, which is the normal culture. Please feature your cameras. We can have the, the pictures. So Mr. Jeff, please hope you are ready for the pictures. Okay, the president are there, that's good. Yes, let's activate our, our cameras. Um, activate, camera activated, please. We'd like to see your beautiful faces. <laughs> Others who are waiting. Please turn on your cameras, please. If you can. It's gonna be taken any moment from now. Okay. Next group. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Nice shots. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in Port Harcourt. I'm presently in Port Harcourt and I'm looking forward to seeing some of us on Saturday for our annual lecture in Port Harcourt and um, uh, subsequently in Ghana, in two weeks time, we're also going to be having the um, same thing. So thank you everyone for making tonight um, another wonderful, um, month for us talking about our monthly webinar. Uh, we look forward to another interesting topic uh, next month by the special grace of God as we'll bring, you know, 
another interesting professional around the globe. But this time around, it's going to be from Nigeria. So please um, expect to get the best from IM Africa. Have a wonderful night's rest in regards to the families. All right, good night, everyone. Princess, you wanted a good afternoon. We are going to sleep, so you... Okay, night. enjoy your sleep. I'm still awake here. We are till we get to night, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nino. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. <laughs> See you next month. Hello, Mr.